Max Highlights, and here's your host, Karin Helmstedt. Greetings from Berlin and a warm welcome to our Highlights edition. And we've got these and other stories lined up for today's program. Future food. Create your favorite dishes with a 3D printer. Spot the stars gate crashing at some major bashes at the Berlinale. And give him a hand, photographer Ray Massey's optical illusions. Well, the hype was absolutely huge around the first 3D printers when they emerged a few years ago. A manufacturing revolution was underway. And meanwhile, with the price of those printers becoming more and more affordable, the technique is being used to make everything from shoes to lamps to instruments. Well, that inspired one Spanish startup to take the idea even further. And they recently unveiled a 3D printer to create food. And not very appetizing, you might be thinking. But we went to see who's keen to use it and how. Star chefs and twins, Javier and Sergio Torres, describe themselves as both Spanish and international. They enjoy experimenting in their restaurant above the rooftops of Barcelona, and that means combining fresh, homegrown produce with modern technology. Their kitchen devices are always state-of-the-art. Today, Sergio is trying out a 3D food printer. He's currently printing rice pudding in honeycomb form. It's novel for sure, but it's too early to assess the impact of these technological innovations on the way we eat. I'd say they offer a lot of opportunities, but we'll have to see. Try things out, analyze things. The ingredients need a cookie dough-like consistency. The mass goes into capsules and the printing can begin. The resulting shapes still have to go into the oven, as do printed pizzas to which toppings are added by hand. The 3D food printer, which goes by the name Fudini, was developed by a Spanish startup company. Lynette Kuzma is one of the startup's four founders. It's easy to think of it as an assembly device. So take ravioli as an example. How often do people make homemade ravioli from scratch? Probably not very often, despite the plethora of pasta machines on the market. From a home kitchen perspective, people are interested in making fresher foods, whether it's whole meals or snacks. From a restaurant perspective, they're really interested in the designer elements. The device will hit the market this year. It'll retail for a thousand euros. The idea is that the chef programs the design of the dish into the computer. And as this spinach tart shows, the creative possibilities are endless. Imagine you went home tonight and you printed something on Fudini that you created and you want to share it with your friends. You can share it through social media sites, upload your recipe to a community, and recommend to a friend that, hey, you know, I really came up with this cool thing to print on Fudini. I think you should try it. It's really good. This has come out of a printer? And it's edible? It's good. It can't be from a printer. It's really good. It's great. The shapes are imaginative. Tasty. Really tasty. Printer food tastes good, but only if those who are making it and baking it know what they're doing. Thankfully, our hands will not become obsolete. The machine can't make the food taste good. It doesn't cook it for you. What it does help with is the visuals and to create shapes that wouldn't be possible without it. Artichokes in Iberian ham sauce is a classic Spanish dish that's been newly interpreted by the Torres brothers. The 3D printer is a source of inspiration. Let's think about this. We can turn the artichokes upside down and draw something in the artichoke itself, or use the sauce to draw the artichoke and then sit the artichoke on top of it. We've already ordered a prototype to practice on. We have so many ideas about what we could do with it, and we want to try them out and see if they work. If they do, it would be amazing. 
Y si es así, crazy. pues eh, sería magnífico. No, sería un... vamos. The brothers have already written their restaurant logo using a parade from their new menu. So they're off to a great start. Well, all this past week, the Berlinale, that's Berlin's international film festival, has been underway. And it's an event that gives this city's already erudite chic an extra portion of glam. Well, the festival is not only a major platform for the art of film, but it's also a gathering, a key gathering of industry professionals. And so the list of parties is pretty nearly endless. But what might look like carefree hobnobbing is most often serious business. The Berlinale turns Berlin into the city that never sleeps. After the film premieres are over, that's when the parties really get going. From casting directors to actors to directors, it's a who's who of cinema. The name of the game is to see and be seen. Reviews are mixed, though. Parties are awful, horrible, so superficial. Everyone's lying and saying, oh, you look wonderful. I hate parties. That's why I'm always going to them. It's nice that uh, everyone is involved in the same uh, event for the same reasons. Like everyone here is, loves film and, um, and is talking about film, which is great. It's a fun way to meet up and talk to people. Otherwise, you just see the same people every day. The festival keeps getting better, and it's so central. You meet the filmmakers here and the funders. That's how films are made. That's why it's important to be here. The heart of the festival is here at Potsdamer Platz. A major film sponsor is holding a reception at the Ritz-Carlton. It's invitation only. No autograph seekers allowed. Screenwriter Anna Brüggemann has one of the coveted invites. It's a special Berlinale for her this year. She has a movie in the main competition program and is vying for a golden bear. It's great to have the feeling, yes, I'm legit. I can walk around and have my picture taken. Other times I felt a bit like an imposter. This time I feel like, yes, I'm allowed to be here with my dress and lipstick. <laughs> She spent the morning rushing from one appointment to the next. The veteran actress and screenwriter lives in Berlin. So she's a pro when it comes to the festival. Part of our job is giving lots of interviews. Then you have sponsors who hold receptions where you also have to make an appearance. Or you get an invitation to something. And for us ladies, part of our job is looking nice too. Brüggemann is helping promote her film Stations of the Cross with her appearances. So even after hours events are part of her job description. It's a different kind of partying, because you always have it in the back of your mind that you're not just partying, you're there to see and be seen. And it's like a big family event. It can get pretty crazy. About 20,000 industry pros have gathered for the 10-day festival. And that means galas and receptions galore across the entire city. A major television broadcaster is hosting a bash at the Museum for Communication. For the actors and filmmakers here, it's a way to express their gratitude. And that means celebrating to the flash of the cameras and in view of their sponsors. It's more like work than a party. It's work, but it's also fun. Where else can you have a glass of wine when you're working? It's a chance to see people in the industry and to see friends, some of whom I haven't seen in ages. Maybe I'll see a producer who will offer me a role. No, that's not why I'm here. I just want to be part of it. It's my job, and that's why I'm here. This year, thank the Lord, I don't have a film here, so I can just enjoy myself. Back to Anna Brüggemann, who's off to the after party, accompanied by her film team, her family and friends. It's packed, but she manages to catch up with a few friends. 
Der ganze Tag war halt ein einziger Wahnsinn. It was a crazy day. Nach der Premiere war ich relativ I was platt. pretty wrecked after the premiere and now I'm glad my friends are here. But I'll go home soon. I have to catch a cab at 8 a.m. tomorrow for the next interview. Whether it's a premiere gala or a celebrity reception, at the Berlinale, the stars certainly come out at night. Well, parties and schmoozing with the Glitterati are certainly the last thing on Silvia Furtwängler's mind. Five years ago, she and her family emigrated from Germany to rural Norway, where she now concentrates on her main passion, which is dog sled racing. Furtwängler is, in fact, one of the world's top mushers and one of very few women in that field. And she's the owner of 37 huskies who amount to much more than just best friends. Zilia Fortwängler always prepares the sled out of sight of her dogs. They're so eager that it's easier to wait till she's ready to leave. Then she heads off with her team of 13 through the wilderness of Norway. After 30 kilometers, Zilvia's Alaskan Huskies are still going strong. The sled dogs are known for their endurance and they continue running into the night. It takes the dogs a little while to settle down after their workout, but then they're ready for dinner. Today, there's only dry dog food on the menu. Here in the south of Norway, the next town that has a butcher where she can get fresh meat is more than 40 kilometers away. Devil is one of her favorites. He's not a devil at all. He doesn't live up to his name. He's a complete sweetheart. The dogs give so much back to me and I'm really grateful. They're what makes the dream possible, the dream of sledding. The adventure and the expeditions. As well as making it possible for us to take part in big races. Zilia and her dog teams have been taking part in the world's top races for years now. Last year they competed in the Grand Odyssey in the French Alps. There was a blizzard overnight. It snowed so much that some of the dog kennels were buried under the snow. Sometimes Zilvia had to get up in the middle of the night to make sure that none of the dogs had been trapped. That's the first one. The Huskies don't seem to care all that much about their kennels. They're used to snow and cold. Although it's just 210 kilometers away from the capital of Oslo, it's like another world up here in the Hadanger Vida National Park. There isn't even a road leading up to the house on the plateau. Five years ago, the Furtwanglers moved here with their Alaskan Huskies. They chopped their own wood for the stove that heats the house and they bake their own bread. They moved here in part because of the sled dogs, but they like their simple life here too. 18-year-old Stephen gets up at five o'clock to go to school. It takes him an hour and a half on the snowmobile to get to the town of Ryukan. <laughs> But the long distances are no problem for Huskies. If they could, they'd run all the way to Ryukan themselves. Because of the blizzard, they're stuck here for three days. When Zilvia finally gets the sled out and her husband Jürgen prepares the harnesses, the dogs are beside themselves with excitement. The team will include 13 dogs again today. The older dogs have to stay behind, and so do the youngest ones, like five-month-old Devil. 
he'll have to wait until he's about 18 months old to go on a training run. Then it will take another three to four years before he can be a lead dog. The team is raring to go. Every dog has its own job. The lead dog has the most difficult job. That's Lion, who has to find the right path and respond to the musher's commands. In the back, it's strength that counts most. The strong dogs that are placed directly in front of the sled are called wheelers. It's their job to pull the sled out of trenches in the snow and around corners and trees. And they're off. The Huskies come alive with power and energy. Even though it's starting to snow again, Sylvia Furtwängler is glad to be out again training with her dog team. Well, when it comes to painting or drawing or sculpting, you could say that hands are the ultimate tools of the artist. But in the case of British photographer Ray Massey, hands are also his favorite subject. With the help of a body painter colleague, Massey creates trompe l'oeil illusions using human hands as his actual canvas. And so we went to see the process behind these astonishing shots. You only get these pictures when you take a closer look. The well-camouflaged hands transformed into art. The pictures were taken by the renowned British photographer Ray Massey. I became a photographer because I didn't want a desk job, I think was the main uh, incentive. But uh, no, I discovered photography when I was about 13. We did pinhole camera in uh, general science at school. And when I saw my first print uh, sort of come up in the developer, that was, you know, just totally uh, found that was absolutely magical. Today, Massey is recreating The Scream by Norwegian painter Edvard Munch. For hand model Tara Malik, this is an unusual kind of shoot. Sometimes you, you have hand models who've got fantastic hands, but somehow they don't really understand quite what to do with them and, and how to put them. But Tara is really, really patient and, you know, understanding what we're trying to achieve. Ray Massey's longtime collaborator is British artist Annie Raleigh. She helps him create his optical illusions. It takes her hours to prepare the model's hands. Today, she spent three hours with Tara. There's contours on the hand, and it's going in, and it's slightly distorted. Uh, I have to, to look at it from the angle of the camera, um, and then paint it accordingly. The shoot is taking place in Ray Massey's studio, housed in a former church in the North London borough of Camden. It was here in the capital that his career began. Back in the swinging 60s, this is where he studied and worked as an assistant to some famous photographers, including Richard Avedon. I really wasn't enchanted with the fashion world, um, a studio full of um, egos of art directors, of fashion editors, of hairstylists, makeup art. It was my idea of hell. He soon found his niche, still lifes. He's been working in advertising as a photographer for four decades now. He made a name for himself first and foremost with what's called liquid photography. He started taking his hand photographs after he created some images for an ad campaign for a British insurance company. They were picked up and reproduced in the media and numerous blogs. It prompted Ray Massey to see what else he could do with hand photography. Go. Yeah. We're trying to produce an emotion with, with the hands. And if we're talking to a person, you can always make a person look happy or sad or smile, look grumpy, screw up your eyes, you know, whatever. You can be rude to them and make them arrogant. You can do all, you know, you control those things but it's much harder to get 
some kind of feeling or story in, 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 into the hands, isn't it? And as I say, hands sometimes, you, you can move them one millimetre and they go from looking beautiful to being very ugly because they're not really intrinsically pretty things. So the next time you're in London, don't put your hands in your pockets. You never know. You might just be discovered by Ray Massey. And we finish off with a trip to beautiful Tyrol. That's a state in Western Austria that's made up almost entirely of mountains, which means, of course, that it's extremely popular with outdoor enthusiasts, both in the summer and the winter. And Kitzbühel is one of its best known resorts. Well, in fact, the ski areas in and around the Turn Pass in the Kitzbühel Alps were recently named the best in the country. And so we went to see what all awaits the lucky visitor. Between the 3,000-metre high peaks of the Kitzbühel Alps, the only way is down. But what makes this area between Kirchberg and Jochberg one of the largest ski areas in Europe is the 3.5-kilometre cable car that bridges an entire valley. Every day, winter sports enthusiasts can explore new territory here. More than 170 kilometres of slopes tempt skiers to ride to the top. There's something for everyone. I love the mountains. What could be better? If you experience the mountains like this, you want to come here again and again. If you come here and see this, if you're here with heart and soul, it's just fantastic. This has a lot of atmosphere and flair. The slopes are well prepared. And even away from the slopes, there's a lot on offer. In the Zonbühl Chalet, for example, you can recharge your batteries for the next ski run in rustic surroundings. When booking skiing lessons at the Red Devils Ski School, a visit to the best chalets is included in the price. And the Red Devils can teach you the perfect skiing techniques, from simple turns for beginners to race training. There's the snowplow turn for beginners, and beyond that, anything is possible. It always depends on the guests and what shape they're in. Since then, the small town of Kitzbühel has developed into a meeting place for the rich and famous. No wonder that the old town has become a glamorous shopper's paradise. The first address in style is Franz Prader's boutique. For more than 50 years, he has produced tailor-made skiing and winter fashion for Kitzbühel's guests from all over the world. My first celebrity customer was Romy Schneider, who learned to ski here. Back then, stirrup pants were the fashion. We made a lot for her. Pants, blazers, everything. Romy Schneider came here often. Tailored ski pants were something actors Robert Redford and Roger Moore also appreciated. The celebrities who shopped at Franz Prada usually stayed at the Hotel Zotenne, it's been the epitome of Tyrolean hospitality for nearly 100 years. A lot of celebrities who come here like the fact that we don't make a fuss over them. Tyrolians are very confident people, and that can be seen in the way they deal with guests. And those who aren't so keen on the hustle and bustle of Kitzbühel Apre Ski can retreat to the Kitzbühel Acher Valley, where the quiet village of Jochberg hides a culinary secret. The Zaukasa Stuben serves Tyrolean cuisine, such as soup with chopped tripe and fresh bread. And whoever is willing to travel 1,200 meters up the slope to Rosi's Sonnenbergstuben will be warmly greeted by its guitar-playing owner. Of course, the guests must feel that you like them and that they're welcome. I always say I love my guests, and people probably notice that everything comes from the heart, that there's nothing fake about it. I enjoy doing this, and I also like to sing for my living. Singing always brings people together. At Rosie's Sonnenbergstuben, the celebrations often go late into the night, showing that Tyrol can be a whole lot of fun too. 
Well, that's all we have time for today. So thanks very much for watching. And if you want to know any more about any of those reports, just head to our website or be sure to catch up with us on Facebook. But for now, alles Gute von uns hier in Berlin und auf Wiedersehen.